Welcome to Breeders Syndicate, where we explore the history of a clandestine scene through the eyes of the folks who live here. I'm Matthew, owner of Riot Seeds. I'll occasionally be joined by my co-host Nacho Dog, breeder and grower from Mendocino. Welcome to the Underground. What's right. up, everyone? So we talked earlier, and we were going to um, do a little spotlight on um, you know, my old man, Nat. Yeah. Um, yeah, we're going to uh, talk about the, uh, I think, the return of Neville era, when it was uh, Mr. Nice 2009 to 2011, I think it was. Uh, somewhere in between there. It wasn't a full two years, but it was in there, in that region. So, yeah. Um, we also... We also thought too that maybe we could do a little uh, question and answer. Oh yeah, um, Matt's a lot better at reading comments and does a lot more uh, cultivating over there than I do. So yeah. uh, <laughs> ask away, you know, and and maybe it might get answered. But we were chatting a couple weeks ago, um, sort of about that that era, and there's yeah. a bunch of stuff that started happening at Mister Nice because it was a new forum, and you know, a lot of old timers and heavy hitters started showing up and saying stuff. Yeah. And so a whole lot of what we know, um, you know, from the 80s or whatever, in the early 90s, um, kind of got talked about extensively by the people 10 years later, 15 yeah. years later. Um, and so a lot of what we reference is like their own words comes from that era that Matt was talking about. Yes, indeed. Yeah, it was kind of cool um, when when Neville popped back up. I was already on the forum, and it was uh, it was kind of unexpected. All of a sudden, he was there and answering questions, and it was like, holy shit, you know, w w the guy that that we all kind of looked up to. Mo most most people that start selling seeds, I mean, he was the the dude a lot of us looked up to, and we were finally able to ask him questions. We had questions about certain things, and he was more than willing to answer questions. Now, whether or not we got uh, the most direct um, true answers is is still to be debated, but it was a lot of them were very very helpful and informative. Yeah. People said Mr. Nice was Shanti Baba. Mr. Nice's website is is still up. Mm -hmm. uh, the forum is still active. It's not nearly as active as the era we're going to discuss, um, but it it definitely still exists. Uh, Shanti Baba and Neville had a business relationship that went on for quite some time, and they used Howard Marks likeness and name essentially. And name. So after, uh, after Neville left Sensi, he partnered in some fashion with um, Shanti, and that led to a partnership with Greenhouse and Arjun. And then when, um, when Shanti and Neville left Arjun and Greenhouse, they went off and did Mr. Nice in Switzerland. Yeah. Um, and I think it was primarily Shanti at that point, but Howard yeah. Marks and Neville I've were never... sort of... I never saw Howard Marks have much to do with anything at Mr. Nice when I was, you know, really active. Um, I do think he just owned a part of it because they used his likeness and name. Yeah, yeah. I think they I think he had a cool name and um, I think they used him as, uh, you know, he had a very photogenic story. Yeah. And he was sort of at the part in a time in his life um, that selling his story was a thing. Yeah. Yeah, and, and his wife had a book. He had a book. There was a movie a lot of people haven't seen that was released in the UK called Mr. Nice. That was actually, it was, it was decent. It was decent about Howard Mark's life. I mean, the, the autobiography is fantastic. Yeah. Um, you know, and just for people that are listening or whatever, he bought somebody's identity in England in the, in the 60s who never really traveled. Yeah. And it was actually pronounced French like Mr. Nice. Like Nice oh, France. Yeah. Like, yeah. like you're going to Nice. Yeah. It was actually, that's how it was pronounced, but he changed it. He just changed it to Mr. Nice. Yeah. Same spelling, just different, yeah. you know, just different connotation or whatever. Because back then, uh, at least he says in the book, you know, he bought multiple different people's identities who were never planning on leaving uh, Great Britain. Yeah. So that he could have different passports and different identities to go around to all these countries and get away with all this smuggling pre-internet days were fucking bomb before they could check out all that shit. Yeah, so, I mean, yeah. in a way, Mr. Nice was kind of a cool seed company because it was a legendary old smuggler of hashish and marijuana mm -hmm. and two, you know, um, and Neville and Shanti. 
Yep. So it was kind of like a sort of a superstar collective, if you will. Yeah. Uh, in terms of weed legends. Well, I mean, Mr. Nice, I, I can't honestly say that Neville was a part of Mr. Nice at any point. I'm not sure if he was. I know, he, you know, he sold Shanti a good deal of his genetics. So they were his actual genetics when he was having legal troubles, I believe, in Australia. I think, I yeah, I, I, I mean, I don't know. I think the, that came later, actually. But what I do think is that I think Howard Marks and Neville had a piece. I of... don't think so, because when Neville came back, one of the main things, and, and we'll talk about this more in detail, he, um, he was really pissed that Shanti only ever paid him $250,000 for those genetics when he needed that money. And he felt that he was owed a lot more. So he didn't have a piece. He felt he was owed a lot was, more because Shanti had made a lot, lot more. more. But so maybe, that maybe we should get, before we get ahead of ourselves. Yeah. Um, because what I think you're talking about before is like when he was in Australia and the clink, mm -hmm. how he got out uh, was the drunkers bought his business. Okay, so this is a different time. Whatever. So this is a different time, but he's Shanti had gave him two two hundred fifty grand was his quote. One of the ways that we know Shanti Baba had access to a bunch of this old shit that he claims to have mm -hmm. is because Neville told us that he sold him his entire old seed collection for a quarter of a million dollars. Yeah. Yep. So it's verification. A lot of people claim they have old things, but how they got them. The chain of command, the chain of custody is a little suspect. A little dubious. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, Shanti, for all of his claims, uh, you know, his, his, his origin story is phenomenal. Yeah. Yeah. We know that he at least had access to these genetics at one time. To use. Yeah. You know, and so the question is, is more of how many of them does he still have? Yes. Versus did he ever have access? Yeah. Yeah, because we know he Neville, had access. Neville gave him a bunch of their collection when they were working together doing the Super Silver Haze, Mango Haze, Neville's Haze thing, and the Greenhouse gig. Yeah. And then at some point, he sold him his seeds. And a lot of what, you know, a lot of what is sold at Mr. Nice is claimed to have come from old Neville seed. Yes. Quite a bit, quite a bit of the stock. Almost all of it, except for the, the widow stuff, yeah. The widow stuff. And yeah, they, it all sort of originates from clones or old seeds from Neville. Yeah. And it's corroborated by Neville said that, you know, he, he sold them. Yep. So I think part of the problem, part of, part of the, the interesting part to people is, is going to be what Neville said. Yeah. Um, Neville is one of those people that it seems like every five or six years his life burned down. Mm -hmm. um, and even though he was one of the originators and everybody grows his shit, um, he didn't end up like Arjun or something. He didn't end up filthy rich. Um, before he died, yes. Before, yeah, well. Yeah, exactly. I mean, technically, yes, but no. For most of his life, he was not. I mean, I'm sure Mozart looks down and thinks how many other people made money off his music. Without a but, doubt. Yeah. But he died a pauper in a, in a dirt yeah. grave, you know? Yeah. Um, but, you know, Neville was pissed that he felt like he, he, started, yes. he started the movement. And he's the one that exploded the Dutch scene. Yes. And he ended up going to prison and being chased by the DEA and having all these issues. And, and he was, everybody else was profiting off things hugely that he wasn't. Yeah. And so instead of him ending up being like, you know, a Ford or, a, or you know, a Henry Ford type of thing, you know, I mean, actually, it's more like this. It's like he was the Tesla, not yes. Edison. Yes. You exactly. know? Um, yeah. And so, you know, he did a ton of stuff and we're all indebted to him in various ways. But, um, you know, you know, there's the, the Sensi era and the Greenhouse era and the Mr. Nice era. And, you know, um, he had a lot of issues. Yeah. But yeah. what was cool is that when Mr. Nice set up his forum, uh, when Shanti set up the forum, there was a bunch of forums at the time, obviously. Yeah. Matt can speak to them more than I can. Mm -hmm. um, but... What happened is when Neville decided, I'm going to come out of the shadows and start answering questions on only Mr. Nice's forum. Yes. Then that basically did this thing where all of a sudden, all this stuff we've been debating forever, you could fucking ask him. The, the part that I, I found the most interesting and because like some of this is missing now, like a lot of the back and forth was during this time when he popped up, it was almost a 
a gang war between the icy maggers that were like Sam the Skunk Man. Oh, uh, for sure, yes. Positive. I was gonna I was gonna bring that up that basically like an enormous amount of old timers started popping up um, at Mister Nice and adding yes. color and adding depth and corroboration to various stories. Mm -hmm. But then there was a camp at there was like the Neville camp at Mr. Mm -hmm. Nice. And there was like the Dave Watson, Sam Skunkman thing at ICMAC. Yes. And uh, they took pot shots at each other. Yeah, there were epic videos. They used, um, it was an old website called Jib Jab. And you could do these Kung Fu like videos and you could put what the text says, like write what text you wanted in it. Mm -hmm. And him and Neville would go back at Sam and, or maybe like uh, Cash Rock, someone that was friends with Sam. Um, would do the half of it from Sam's point of view, like talking shit about Neville and these Kung Fu things. And then Neville would have one of us write something funny, talking shit back at the IC Mag guys and Sam. But I don't think those videos exist anymore, but they were fucking hilarious. And I wish they did. I mean, what's interesting about that is that for all of those battles, there's not really all that much that Sam and Neville disagree on. No, no. You know, like the, they back up each other's stories quite a bit. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a difference. There's a difference in they both agree that, you know, Neville got haze from Sam. Yes. Um, Sam, I think, has told three or four different stories about exactly what Neville got. Yes. Neville's been pretty consistent or was pretty consistent. Yeah. And what it what had happened. He had one version and he just kind of stuck to it. Yeah. Yeah. He was pretty um, good at like if he if he had a version, he stuck to it. Whether it was true or not, he fucking stuck to that shit. He I mean it's it. It, it becomes hard. It's like we and one of the one of the reasons why we wanted to chat about this is because it relates to so much different stuff today. And it was one of those rare times where um, you know, Matt and I and friends and stuff, we still refer back to tons of those posts. Yeah. Um, because Neville explained in detail. Uh, what he was up to. And yeah. one of the funny things about Neville uh, is that not to say that not to say that uh, um, he always told the truth or anything like that. But um, because he was first, uh, he was a lot more open than almost anyone. Yeah. At just saying not only what his hybrids were, but um, who he got them from and how. Yeah where after Neville, everybody started to clam up and mysteries of even what it was. Yeah. Uh, and where, where they got whatever they used from. I thought, I think, I think Neville realized pretty early on that despite people having the recipe or knowing what strains were in what, that there was no way they were going to be, be able to reproduce any of the phenotypes or anything that he was showing or selections. He knew really early on that that wasn't going to be the case. So there was no reason to, to, uh, hide a lot of the, the stuff. Though I do, personally, one of my theories, I think he, he hid quite a few things on um, and, and lied about it. But I just saw a, a comment that I'll just interject real quick. Sure. I, have, we have a, I have an old buddy of mine uh, that just commented that he got some old Neville's haze for me. And I had brought home, when I, when I had brought home some haze from Europe one of these times, and I was testing them out at my house, you know? Mm -hmm. And he had like this 10 by 10 space he had a big garden in his backyard in mendocino mm. county uh, but he had this space that was unused and he was like dude you want to give me some heads i just have this space i did, i got this section of the bed i didn't fill in you want right? to give me some head that's nice of so <laughs> i gave him i gave him like four or five uh, of these haze plants right in july yeah. okay yeah. now you got to realize like the whole back of the thing is full of six foot tall sour diesels all kinds of different strains big bushy strains been in there for a couple of months and i gave him like four clones this big mm -hmm. Well, fast forward two and a half months, and these things are four feet above the top of his fence. <laughs> they, they took up yeah. the whole 10 by 10. I think he ended up cutting them down around Thanksgiving, and they weren't done. It was killer weed, though, even oh, though it bet. needed probably another two or three weeks. But we, we tried out these four little clones, and they yeah. turned into this ginormous jungle weed Yeah, that went everywhere. It was pretty intense. Yeah, that alcohol uh, cold can be that I that I had. Um, it was it was one of those ones you could flower as a seedling and it would be fucking eight, nine feet tall, just candelabra yeah. style. I yeah. mean, it was just it was funny, too, because like the way is the way his backyard went, it like sloped down. And so you really could never see anything, even if he grew huge plants back there. 
Yeah. And then I came over and there's like these giant branches poking up over the fence where you'd never seen them before. Yeah. Uh, but it just got to the point where that thing was gonna, it was growing eight inches a day in every direction. Yeah. And so it just like exponentially like, you know? Yeah, that shit's wild to watch how quick it can grow. It was. And so, but, so what, you know, one of the things is that when we talk like about a lot of the, when we did a bunch of the podcasts on like the Neville era and the, and the seed bank era. Yeah. Uh, a lot of what we say, um, you know, comes from that later time uh nuance and stuff that neville answered yeah the questions um you know in at the mr nice era and so that also did things where it brought some people out of the woodwork um like uh some uh some pretty big people in europe were commenting on it uh and ortega popped in and started commenting on what he had given neville and what neville had given him and so all of a sudden you're watching a bunch of these like old school legends that started it yeah and they're chatting back and forth about what what they did for each other. Yep. And what's what's amazing with that is you always wonder when you only have one person telling a story, you know, how do you how do you corroborate it? How do you make sure it's true? How do you weed out the bullshit? Yep. You know, and then all of a sudden you get two or three people talking about the same thing and you know who they all are, and you're like, okay, well, that's you know, yeah, it's probably about as good as you're gonna get. You know, so, um, yeah, so Neville, Neville just openly discussed all the parentage of all his strains. He didn't really have any mystery strains. Yeah. And he discussed how and where he got all the breeding material. And he was probably the last person to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Be because to this day, like some of the second round of stuff, um, you know, like TH seeds or serious seeds or you know, some of the, those kind of people, there's still mysteries that oh, yeah. 25 years later, we have no idea what the parents were or where they got them from. Paradise seeds, why won't you tell us? Yeah, par they're I mean- They're one of the worst for it. I love all their the, stuff. All the, all the second wave, Neville was just like, here's, I mean, like to the point where like we confirmed that, you know, he went back to America and he got G13 and the Pacific Northwest hash plant from two grower friends of Jorge Cervantes. Yeah. And he paid 500 bucks for him. Yep. Uh, you know, our, our, our buddy Greg, who, uh, old Marine, who, uh, uh, you know, Matt interviewed, um, you know, they laid out the NL story back and forth, you yep. know, pretty big time and cleared up a bunch of that. So it's like, oh, I got the, no I got the Northern Lights from this guy. I got these two cuts from this guy. I got this from over here. I got these things from Sam Skunkman. And here's the crosses of all. Yeah. And so it made it like it made it pretty cool for historians or whatever to try to figure out. Um, people just asked about the mango and the SSH. We can get yeah. we can talk about that. But it made it really cool to figure all that stuff out because he gave the layers where all the second wave of, of, of uh, Amsterdam seed banks. Uh, it was all mystery. Yeah, for the most part. Yeah, they would rare, yeah, they would rarely tell you what the parents were. They would rarely tell you the origins of the parents. It was mm -hmm. like, here's the strain name. Here's what it looks like. Here's our description. That's all you know. Yeah. And there's stuff get. like AK-47 or, or Kali Mist or like Sensi Star. Paradise, Sensi Star. Yeah. Um, there's a bunch of stuff where you're just like, oh, I, you still have no idea. Yeah. 30 years, 25, 30 years on, and you're still you st even parentage or where they got it or who they got it from or what it was. Bubble they, gum, same kind of thing. Same kind of thing. Yeah. You know, THC, same kind of thing. There was various things. They basically just said headies from America. Yeah. But, you know, THC, Adam and uh, Simon from Sirius and Tony from Sag Martha, they all worked under Neville for a time. And none of them ever have admitted that they that they got anything from Neville and used it in their own work ever. Yeah, it sounds like they probably should have. I I would think so. You would think I mean, that they you would think that they did it, but they won't. They don't say. Yeah, where I, don't, they got I don't remember. I mean, Dunn might now go back and say certain things, but he's not the most consistent. No, you know, but they just yeah. it was it was more like the the they just decided that secret sauce was best yeah yeah and from then on the 
you know, the pulling the wool over your eyes about strains became ingrained in cannabis mm -hmm. and being open was rare. Yeah. So it's a really, it's a real, it's kind of a treat to be able to just talk about all this Neville stuff and he just laid out what it all was. Yeah. Now, sadly, like with the rename game, um, there's a ton of Neville work in a bunch of our modern shit, but it all goes by different names. Yeah. Yeah. So you just have no idea. Yeah. And you can trace some of it back and you can make guesses. Right? Yeah, you can make some educated guesses, but that's about all we got in some of them. Yeah. I know there was stuff that he would look at and he'd be like, oh, yeah, that's my XYZ, you know, like of modern strains. And he would say what he thought it was. But I mean, even for him, it was a guess at that point. At that point, yeah. And so, you know, and, and during this, I should say during this era, uh, I was starting to have kids and stuff like that. This is like a really um, active era for Matt. Um, yeah. And so you were messaging a bunch with Neville. You yeah. were actually, you know, so not only would he answer things publicly on forums that anybody could log in and see, but he was actually pretty active in communication via email and DM uh, yeah. through those forums then. Yeah. And he so was... any number of people had a bunch of private conversations that revealed more info. Yeah. Yeah. A few of us were really, um, we, we gained uh, uh, what you would, I, I would assume would be a friendship, but it didn't really work out that way. But a few people were able to, to ask him detailed questions and he would respond. He had a really shitty um, connection out in Australia as far as his modem. So the, the amount that he could pop up and talk was very minimal and it was always frustrating for him. Um, that's something I, I remember greatly. Um, but there were also, uh, you know, like when, when one of these dudes comes back out of nowhere and everybody wants something from them, you know, a lot of other people showed up that were uh, other seed breeders that, that wanted a piece of it. You know, they wanted a piece of him. So you had people like Charles Scott showing up from um, Reefer Man. Reefer Man, you know? yeah. And that, that was a, a big part of what happened and, and the falling out of Neville and his disappearance. And then, and then we had our good friend, uh, Kanga, Kanga Tiva. He probably worked with them closer than any of us um, out in Australia. He worked with them hands-on. And he was doing a lot of the actual hands-on breeding and creation of strains while Neville wasn't doing as much that, but directing more from his area. But I do Isn't know it, that Neville was doing some work with his son on a few different things, including a G13 line. Isn't it Kanga that provided us with the one picture of the Hayes C male that we think is legit? I think so. I think that is the, the Kanga's pick, yeah. The, it's his pick, and it was posted on Mr. Nice from yep. his tours going over to see the Switzerland era Mr. Nice, yep. um, you know, breeding projects and something like that. Um, because, you know, a lot of those guys, as, as Shanti and Neville has said, you know, even though they were partners with Arjun and they were moving a bunch of weed and seeds through Greenhouse. Yeah. Because Greenhouse was sort of like the harbor side, for lack of a better term. It was sort of like the big dispensary. Yeah. Right. And so they were still kind of illegally growing weed and illegally making seeds. But then they, as they gave packaging wise, they could show up to Greenhouse and they could sell it through them. Yeah. Right. And so when Switzerland opened up, these guys finally saw a way of like, holy crap, I can do breeding on a greenhouse level. Yeah. I can do things on a much bigger scale. I'm not going to be restricted to like these, you know, these, these canal boats that yeah. we turn into grows and these apartments and these houses and these different things, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so a lot of people came out and visited uh, Shanti and people like Breeder Steve and stuff in Switzerland because all of a sudden they had all these projects that they wanted to do. And they started doing a bunch of work. Yeah. Making a bunch of seed. And we should also probably say that like the, one of the things that I saw at least as like a big interest in Mr. Nice and Shanti Baba at the time with, with the, with the seed bank was that at that point, Neville was famous enough that everybody wanted access to his old strains even then. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the seed bank was gone and nobody really trusted Sensi anymore. Yeah. So they sort of viewed what Neville had given Shanti as the last legitimate, you know, uh, source. Yeah. Right. Because because Neville gave him a bunch of clones and tons of old seed. Yeah. And then he sold a bunch of that. And so at that point, we're talking 2009, 2010. Everybody, everybody had already figured out that since he had outsourced everything to Spain. Right. Yeah. And nobody really trusted their work anymore. Yeah. Their era was sort of done. Yeah. 
So if you wanted that old shit, everybody sort of felt like that was the spot. And then Neville, and then Neville coming online, uh, yeah. sort of gave it a ton of legitimacy. Yeah, because you're asking yeah, yeah. about his his old shit. And this, and for people that don't know, like looking back, I saw someone um, bring up the CBD era. This is before all that. This is before. This is during the era where Shanti was fucking militant about fucking fem seeds being trash. Fem seeds are fucking gonna ruin cannabis. So there was no CBD crew. There was none of this going on. He was militant anti fem, and the CBD crew was some of the first fem work, and it was done by Jaime of Resin Seeds, not Shanti at the time. I know someone mentioned that earlier, but that was a, a little bit later of an era. Yeah, I mean. Uh... We talked about on an earlier podcast that when Matt and Rascal and Hybe and others started doing reversals, it was not met with a warm, welcoming situation by most of the community. There was yeah. a lot of breeders and there was a lot of retail people that thought it was cheating and long term harmful. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think, I think, you know, Shanti's CBD work is more like five or six or seven years ago beginning. Yeah, and, and, and it was mostly Jaime. It was Jaime from yeah. Resin Seeds. It was re originally it was called Resin Seeds, and he released a strain called Canatonic. He had a fake HP13 sour diesel hybrid. He had a few others. Um, uh, there was a MK Ultra hybrid that he had, and um, a lavender, lavender bubblegum that he had, and they didn't do so well. But the Canatonic did kick these crazy CBD lines. So after a few years of resin seeds being around, they started working into just the CBD stuff, which became the CBD crew. So, well, you know, the reason why we wanted to do this, this chat or whatever is when, when Matt and I were chatting about like the beginning of the Femme and Reversal era, this is the exact same era. Yeah. It's just that there was like four or five dudes at most playing around with reversals. And the vast majority of the seed community was still looking at it like some bullshit tech that was yeah. going to lead us down the wrong path. Yeah. And it's funny how within 10 years that thing flipped and the regular seeds became the unicorn and the reversals became the standard operating procedure. Yeah. Man, you know? we have a fucking rock star in here. He fucking brought skunk. He fucking knew everything. He was, I love people. Um, yeah. So there was the big dust up between IC Mag and and Mr. Nice on the forums. That would be like uh, me, Bigger, uh, unfortunately, Hempy, a lot of other yeah. people on the Mr. Nice side that were, I, I was ad admittedly kind of drinking the Neville Kool-Aid. And I thought, fuck those guys, you know? It, and it, was, it did cause a lot of uh, headaches for Shanti. And Shanti was not too stoked when Neville came back, not only because of the chaos between Sam and the drama that was stirred up. There was already some drama going on between Aryan and Mr. Nice calling each other fucking water boys and whatnot. So when Neville came back, he also, like I said, demanded more money from Shanti. And that's what slowly started the decline of Neville there. Um, I don't know that Shanti necessarily liked the attention that Neville was getting either because he was getting kind of overlooked uh, in favor of Neville being there answering questions. And I remember in some of the private communications that Neville isn't even alive anymore to talk about it. I don't think he'd mind me sharing private communications, but that was one of the big things was that Shanti didn't want him on the site. He felt, and this is from Neville's point of view, not Shanti's. He felt that Shanti was very angry that he was there and getting all the attention on his site. And uh, he wanted to go elsewhere by that point. And this is maybe six months after being there. But he had a major interest in the American genetics too. He wanted to know more about the OG Kushes, the Bubba's, the G13. He wanted to see what had happened with that over time. Um, but yeah, his, his interest seemed to mostly swing over to the American, what we would call Indicas during that time. Yeah. And I mean, there's an aspect too that I've told Matt this a bunch, um, but I feel like the 90s and the early 2000s and stuff and what happened in Europe, uh, you know, history repeats itself often. And we see it over here in America now and the various beefs and the various camps sure. and the issues and which side do you get on? Who do you believe more? Yeah. Um, and it also goes to show that in an era of prohibition uh, and gray area, it's often hard to maintain partnerships over the long time without 
one or more parties getting upset at each other. Yeah, it, uh, it gets you, rough. You see it right now with, I mean, I don't, I don't need to name the crews, but name most of the faint, super famous lines that are out right now are families. Mm -hmm. And, it, you know, the that stuff getting famous broke up friendships. Yeah. You know, and Neville wasn't particularly friendly with any of his ex-partners. He wasn't particularly friendly. I mean, to some people. <laughs> but it, it just depended. Um, I really felt like uh, he was friendly to people that he felt could take him further in what he was interested in, if yeah, that I makes mean, sense. The, the Dutch, I've said this a ton too, but the Dutch have a very different approach than Americans to marijuana. Um, they are much, much, much more money and business oriented. Yeah. Um, you know, and, um, you know, Americans have kind of like a hobbyist weed nerd approach, at least with some people. Yeah. Uh, Neville was a blend of the two and that Neville did give a shit. Uh, and Neville did love weed, but he also was Dutch and had a massive strain of that, like, he wanted money. They wanted rep. Yeah. He was an early proponent of, if you're using my shit, you should give me credit and money. Yes. And like and I he, said, he <laughs> had, he had to deal with Shanti for 250 grand. He gave him all the strains. He came back X amount of years later and said, wait, this motherfucker made more than I thought he was going to make. He owes me money. And he, and, and, and this is not from Shanti's side. This is from Neville's side. Neville came to me and said, I, you know, what do you think about this? This is the amount of money I got that, I think I deserve more money, don't you? And I'm like, well, I'm fine. Yeah. So by, by that point, you know, from, you know, I, I mean, I, I had a couple conversations with Neville, nothing super deep or as extensive as you did. But my general sense from what friends of his told me is that he felt like he broke barriers and went to jail for it. And then Ben and Alan Dronkers got to got rich off his company. Yeah. Right. And then he left and he, and he worked with Greenhouse and Shanti and Arjun and Arjun got hella rich yeah. off his weed and his seeds and his work and all the cups that Arjun won was when Shanti and Neville were there. Yeah. You know? In fact, Neville, uh, Arjun got banned for a couple of years for trying to bribe a cup after uh, <laughs> Neville and Shanti went and remember that? Yeah, I do. Uh, he got he got pinched for uh, um, so Neville felt that like he had helped make other people rich. Yeah, his whole career, and Shanti was uh, you know the latest person that was doing that to him. Yeah, yeah. Except for I don't think Shanti actually got nearly as rich as Ben and Alan Dronkers from Sensi, no. or definitely not from Arjun. I think Arjun's probably worth hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, yeah, you know, so it was a little unfair to single Shanti out. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, but he but he but he felt like that had been happening his entire career. Yeah. You know, and so he it felt like <laughs> and he and he felt like he undervalued his company to s selling it to Sensi because he needed to get out of jail and he needed lawyers and he needed to get back to Holland. Yeah. And so he and he kind of felt like Shanti did the same thing in the sense of he was down and hurting and needed money. And so he took a shitty deal for his seeds because he couldn't turn it down. Yeah. But he should have gotten way, way more. Yeah. I mean, 250 grand for that area is bank for seeds. Like, I can't, it blows my mind. It blows my fucking mind that Shanti was even able to pull 250K out of his ass. You know, you like, got to realize too, it. for everyone listening that this, this happened in the 90s or whatever. So it's probably literally like 480 to $540,000 in today's money. Yeah. Yeah. It was a lot of money. When we say two hundred fifty thousand dollars, this is happening in the nineties. Yeah, it probably actually with today's inflation, it would be a few mil. You know, I mean, because I looked it up, like twenty twenty dollars. If you made twenty dollars an hour in nineteen ninety four, which is when yeah. I started became an adult, it's thirty nine bucks now. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. So That's it's probably crazy. doubled. So yeah. maybe it was half a million bucks. Yeah. Which is still a shit ton for seeds. For a seed dude back then, fuck yeah. Especially old seeds. Yeah. You know, that like, you know, and all that. And so, um, you know, but I mean, it's also one of those things where none of us were in the room when any of these deals were being made. So yeah. it's hard to know if Neville was sour grapes or he got he got worked. Yeah. Um, from the way he told it, it, it sounded like he was sour grapes. And, and like I and at the time I liked him a lot. And I but even from his point of view, listening to him, it sounded like 
you are fucking entitled, dude. What the fuck? I mean, the you other know? part of it I'll say is that um, when we were talking about history, sort of the last three big things that Neville did that made a bunch of money was that 1997 Super Silver Haze, Mango Haze, Neville's Haze release. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, taste changed and all that kind of stuff. So, like, after he sold Shanti those seeds, Shanti didn't have a period like Greenhouse did or like Sensi did where they just, yeah, like, no. dominated and made fuck tons of money. Yeah. He, they did, he didn't really have that because because there's so many more, many more people were in it. There was so many more Canadians doing it. There was like a bustling uh, North American scene hitting it everywhere. It was just as that was taking off. The North American scene had just started booming during that era. So, yeah. I mean, you know, since he, you know, when, when the Dronkers bought it from them, they got 10 years of dominance. Yeah. Greenhouse, it, you know, it, it, it made Greenhouse the place to visit in Amsterdam. Yeah. Arjun and his family and all that, they made so much money by winning yeah. all those cups with... For, by buying wife. all those cups, yeah. Well, no, I mean, they, you know, they, they, uh, you know, they had, they had the white family and they had fucking all that hay shit from yeah. Neville and Shanti. So they won with White Widow and with Peacemaker and with Super Silver Haze and with, you know, I mean, I know you're smiling, but it's just like, that probably was some of the better weed over there. Oh, I'm sure. I mean, D Barney's Farm, they were taking turns buying the cup. So, yeah. You know, and <laughs> and all that. And so, you know, people don't know this, but there is, we could get into some more depth on that. So, like, some of the various beefs that people might have interest in. Because, um, you know, the big issue between Neville and, um, <sighs> and Sam, at least as far as I interpret it, is twofold. One, they argued over the exact haze that Neville got. Right? Yeah. And two, um, you know, uh, Neville thought he was a shady American that had ties to the government that fucked Neville over. Yeah, so uh, I'll, I'll go over this one. And I'm going to preface this because I know Mr. Watson has been upset with me even bringing it up. So I'll preface this. This is Neville's story. Um, everything I've researched has shown it not to be correct, um, as best I can tell. I mean, there's no definitive thing saying someone's not a snitch. Um, the way Neville recounted it was that when Sam went over, I'm not even going to say his real name, when Sam went over to Amsterdam, he went over and he was always there with the DEA handler. Granted, the DEA is not supposed to function outside of the United States, but this is the story I was told, um, that he had a DEA handler. Everybody knew who his DEA handler, handler was. And, they, and Neville's quote was, he was called Sam because of Uncle Sam, because he was a government worker. That, they said they gave him the nickname, which we also know is probably not true. Um, but yeah, he said that Neville, or that, that Sam went over there. He was the first person and only person to get the Dutch government's approval to grow cannabis, if I remember correctly. Which he was and, resented for greatly by everyone. Exactly. Because it and, was an American getting the licensing. And Neville basically said the only reason he got it was because of the DEA handler. And the DEA wanted to make money in Amsterdam and control the cannabis. Uh, you know, it's very, very conspiratorial and, and a theory. But there's been no proof to any of that uh, that I can tell. And there's an aspect to it where, you know, when I first started going over to Amsterdam and really got, got started getting to know some of these people. Yeah. Um, or friends of theirs or whatever, <clears throat> is that it became quite evident just like today in today's cannabis world, that there was camps of friends over there and they all didn't get along and they had differing stories and beefs over yeah. origins. Yeah. You know? So Neville's version of the Hayes story is that he got, you know, a bunch of bulk seed from Sam, including Skunk One, and then he paid a bunch of money for a bunch of old seed from, you know, he said it was 15 years old at the time he got it from 70-ish. Um, and out of thousands and thousands of seeds, he got maybe eight or 10 to pop. Yeah. And that's from those seeds is all the breeding that he did and all that. Yeah. And uh, Sam has said that he gave him seeds that he made while in Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. He said he only gave him clones and the shittier clones. Um, he's had a yeah. few different stories of what he's told Neville yeah. that he's written yeah. down like, like at various forms. Yeah. Um, so he said that he gave because now because Sam did go over there and uh, make open pollinations and reproductions of haze. 
Yeah. And he says that everyone over there got those reproductions and no one got original seat. Yes. But Werner at Posse and Carell at SSC and Neville all say they got seed from America. Yes. From from Sam. Sam. Directly. directly. Yeah. Before he had gotten a house, before he gotten set up, before anything. Yeah. That he was selling seeds to make money uh, to get himself started over there. Let me answer this one. McCormick speaks really favorable of Sam. Is that because he knows or because he's got a hold of some of those skunk and NL seeds. Well, Sam had nothing to do with the NL seeds. Um, McCormick's very favorable because he's just what he does. Um, they've been friends for a long time. And, you know, and I mentioned that and stuff. And so, you know, a lot of the stuff that, that, ne that Todd sells um, is stuff that Sam has sold through others for a long time. That never got stopped being sold that never yeah i mean like he claims ancient skunk one and durbin and this and that and Hayes, and you know sam has never wanted to sell directly to the public mm -hmm. um so he's always wholesaled to people <coughs> like sssc or neville or the flying dutchman or seedsman or you know because it's legal to buy a kilo of or kilos of seed directly in holland at the time yeah it was legal to do wholesale seeds within Holland. Yeah. And so he just never got involved with retail. And so Todd sells the same stuff that you could get from Seedsman, that you could get from the Flying Dutchman, that you could get from any number of different sources. And yep. so the sourcing is legit, but he tries to make it seem like they're ancient and rare and they've never before been released. When, as Matt said, they've literally been a constantly available forever. It always blows my mind every time someone resells Skunk One as something new. That's all I'll say on it. I mean, yeah. uh, granted, there, Skunk One is obviously a very desirable plant. It's in a lot of strains. It's in almost every strain ever um, that, that's still around. There's some Skunk One in almost everything, in unless almost it's everything. like an heirloom. Because it makes, well, it makes, you know, uh, you know and, and the funny part about this, maybe we should talk about this a bit, is that, like, while Sam is undeniably a mammoth influence in cannabis, yeah. And Neville is also undeniably a mammoth influence in cannabis. Yes. They enjoyed immensely denigrating the other person as a chump as often as they could get away with it. Yep. You know? And so you really couldn't take what they said about each other. It was like really hard because they disliked each other so much. And this, someone asked earlier about the Afghani one. Why did Neville hate it so much? Well, there's... Neville said that he thought it was what a boring, high, dull, boring high, no flavor. And there's thing. corroboration of this. I mean, like, remember when the when in high times when the connoisseur went and visited Rob, you know? his friend. Yes. Uh, there's that various people that said it was like a, a yeah. heart pounding, shitty body high. Yeah. That it wasn't that tasty. That it just it didn't lead to too many good places. It wasn't that this great is of a because breeder. when that popped up all you had was like Colombians and Mexicans. So they had a certain specific high that they expected from, from cannabis. And here comes Afghanis. And it is much different than the Dutch are used to any of them. Yeah. You know, and I mean the, the Afghani one, I mean, is, uh, you know, it's Mel Frank's weed really. Yeah. Um, you know, the Afghani and the Durban that Sam took to Holland was directly from Mel Frank. And I will go down to my death saying, I think Afghani one is the reason skunk is skunky. Uh, skunk one or, or super skunk is skunky. And I think that the Afghan tea was Afghan one. And I think Neville hit it because he fucking, and that's why he hated Afghani one so much because it was in every last thing of his. That's my theory. Matt, no proof. It is based on fucking nothing though. Don't, don't even listen to me on yeah. this. Matt, Matt but, Long of, uh, got, that's, but that's, that's the funny part is that when we talk about this shit, okay, there's yeah. an aspect where you start talking about all the various people there. And then people, start poking holes in that person's character because it's easy to do because they all have yeah. sus spot stuff that they are involved in. Yeah. And then at some point you're like, well, which of these shady assholes is telling the truth? Yeah. Right. Because they yeah. all have, you cannot be like, well, this is the more high character guy. Yeah, no, it's, it's real hard to do. You know what I mean? Like, uh, but actually, no, I can take that back. Sam the skunk man has never fucked me over. Neville has. <laughs> well, so I can well, say that. But I mean, but I mean, what I mean by that though is that, like, you know, for instance, it's the same thing I have with that TK Origins dude or whatever about the Kush. Yeah. 
Yeah. Like once Sam has written three or four stories of what he gave Neville. Yeah. Well, then which version do you believe? Because they can't all be true. It's an unreliable narrator situation. So he's got to be you lying about some him. of it. Yeah. Because he wrote it all down. Yeah. One of those cannot be true. At least two of those cannot be true if there are three right. statements. One of them, yeah. one of them may be true, Might but be. all the but there can only be one that's true, and so all the other versions have to be bullshit. So which version? Yep. Do you go with? Yes. You know. Yeah. Um, and you know, and when you know, when we interviewed Corell from SSSC, he said that Sam gave ne that Sam gave Neville seat. Yes. But Sam was on Cannabis World or IC Mag or whatever talking about how not only did he not give Neville anything good, but they only, him and Rob gave him the shitty clones that they didn't like as much and overcharged him because he was a dick. Yeah. You yeah. know, and, and then he said that he gave him OP seeds that he'd already made in Amsterdam and he never got any original shit. Yeah. But the weird thing that I'll say about that is that uh, CSI and I and Matt and stuff, we all talk about how plants don't lie. And strangely, even though Sam religiously disses what Neville did and got, the vast majority of the haze cuts that people hoard and want are from Neville work. Yeah. You're not finding a lot of good stuff in any of the positronics, haze, Sam haze direct stuff or even 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 the 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 Carell stuff i mean there's not a lot of keepers in america of any of this stuff you know no. and so all the stuff you talk about all the nl5 haze versions all the you know all most people's haze that they know of is some hybrid of nevels i always wondered why sam never truly worked haze um being that he was the source for it and he only ever released it in ops and stuff it's the most baffling thing ever yeah because and Matt and I chat about this too, where it's like, um, you know, we have some friends that firmly believe Sam everything. Yes. And then yeah, there's, yeah. and then there's me and, and Matt who kind of like, com we, we acknowledge his massive contributions and we think oh, he's yeah. done a ton of stuff, but yeah. that doesn't mean that we think he's a hundred percent accurate on the way he throws it all down either. No, um, I mean, it, it, it would be the same for me. If I'm telling a story, if, if, if I don't like someone, I'm probably going to minimize how much I impact they had on things. Because from my opinion, they didn't have much impact on shit because they were liars. But, but you know, the, 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 the two weirdest things to me about Sam is that what Matt mentioned, which is Hayes was his favorite line. Mm -hmm. And then he spent the next 30 years, by his own admittance, only open pollinating it, trying to keep it as wide as possible and never doing any directional breeding. Yeah too much yeah you know someone said what about sam skunk haze sam skunk haze was so unsellable for people that it was like the classic freebie from C yeah from seed boutique seed there Bay, was C so Bay. many of them these seed boutiques got kilos or whatever and they could never move enough of it so if you bought seeds in the earlier mid 2000s chances you were going to get freebies of skunk haze or skunk tie haze or, skunk tie or the, yeah the yeah. thunk yeah, that's what they called it, the thunk. And I'm not dissing it. I'm just saying that like it just wasn't what people were buying, and so there was way too much of it, and so they gave it. They gave a bunch of it away. You know, uh, someone asked about connoisseurs genetics doing in the UK with Neville's old work. Uh, I I don't know that connoisseur. He wasn't around. Connoisseur was not around hanging out with us when Neville came back. He wasn't in the conversation. I don't know where his sourcing comes from on his Neville stuff, so I can't really comment on that. I can just say he wasn't a part of our crew. And he wasn't before that either. So I don't know where he, he fits in in the equation. You'd have to ask him. So, I, I mean, you know, but basically what it boils down to, I'll say this about him or anyone else, is that most people, um, when they start their own haze lines, they get hybrids from Neville. Like, you know, maybe not directly from him, but some kind of clone only. Yeah. Or they got seed, like for instance, Soma, uh, his Hayes work was based off some G13 by Hayes A seed that Neville gave him. Yeah. And he found a male and that male was the start of his seeds. Yeah. Um, Neville felt like the Kali Mist and a lot of other sativas in Holland were all based off his, his, his Hayes work. Mm -hmm. And they just didn't want to admit it. Yeah. They didn't want to say it was just his. Yeah. Um, but you know, all the NL5 haze, all the PIF, all the SSH, all the mango haze, all the Neville's haze, amnesia, all that. 
it's all from cuts Neville selected and crossed. Yeah. You know, yeah. or and then people took took that stuff and did what they wanted with it. And so I know yeah. that I know that connoisseur or whatever, he's he claims he has some old cuts that were floating around Europe. And yep. he's got, you know, Matt was talking about some of that, some of the stuff that uh, Conga Vita was helping Neville with. Mm -hmm. Kingativa. Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, but, you know, he was doing a bunch of that. What was it? It was like Neville's Haze. Mullen Bibby Madness, stuff like that. He was doing some hybrids because Neville was basically interested in the Grail, the Grail project. Yeah. Which yeah. was we trying, to get, on that. trying to get a fire Haze line, but he felt the Haze genetics were too narrow. I actually did, um, during that time, I did one that was a, oh God, it was like Clockwork Orange, the Piff, and we called it, uh, and, and uh, a Bubba Fino called the Kid's Grail during that time. Yeah, the Outback Haze comes from that work. Yep. There was a bunch of stuff that never, he called it the Holy Grail Project. Um, and it was basically him trying to figure out things he could cross old haze cuts and seed to that would maintain that crazy sativa. Yeah. And so they released a bunch of stuff with various Neville's hazes. Neville's haze was actually not supposed to be released. It was the first step in the Holy Grail project. Yes. It was them taking an, uh, an A5 and crossing it to the C deck and getting yes. both hazes in one plant. Yeah. <clears throat> and it just so happens they found this crazy pheno and decided to release seeds. You know? Yeah. Right? I mean, that's pretty yeah. much what it was. Um, but there was, uh, you know, so yeah, I mean, he would have various partners at various times. Shanti was doing things. Shanti actually has, I think, something he calls Grail Haze, um, you know, right now on his site. You know, he's got, well, I haven't looked. he's got a couple new Haze projects of things that him and Neville were working on, and he just decided to release, um, you know, and I think it's, it's all from that same, same general era when they were crossing various sativas to each other and yeah. seeing what was gonna pop up, you know? Yeah. I don't think it's anything more than that, really. Uh, it's just super, you know, super equatorial, probably. Yeah. You Someone's know. asking about um, Ingemar de Shaman's haze. You know, I never got to run that, but I did grow some of uh, Ingemar de Shaman's other stuff, like the Purple Widow. And all I can say is that stuff does not do well in California indoor. <laughs> it is the, it, I, I have never seen anything herm so bad and auto flower so reliably than Ingemar de Shaman's work grown in the US. It might not do that over there. It might be acclimated for outdoor Amsterdam, but over here it did not do well. Yeah, and I mean, a lot of those haze things, it's like they're, they do do phenomenal outdoor, like those, those ones I gave my buddy, but you know, none, almost none of us live in, near, near the equator. Yeah, that's the problem. So you're not, you're not, you're going to have a hard time finishing any of it. Yeah, I didn't take the time to acclimate them at the time. I didn't even know what acclimating was when I grew them. So there was no, like, there was no me trying to grow a, grow a clone of it. Uh, and also it was auto flowering, so you couldn't take clones of it anyways. Somebody asked, yeah. do you have any hazes currently? Yeah, I mean, I, I have, uh, um, you know, I have a, a, a Cuban black. Uh, I, I've got a couple <laughs> other uh, haze cuts. Big haze. I've got, the, I've, got the, uh, I've got the dog shit, which I view as an NL5 haze pheno. Yeah. So yeah, I have I have four or five or so. Hey, you someone know? just said creepy out of Colombia. That's funny. That's remember I told you a long time ago yeah. over on Mr. Nice's site. There was someone that was from Colombia that sent me seeds of creepy. It was spelled C R I P I, and I always pronounced it creepy because I didn't creepy wasn't a word at the time that people were using in California. So I just I thought it meant creepy, and I thought I'll, he was misspelling. I'll, I'll mention this for a second that uh, someone was just mentioning that um, you know. Uh, metal haze um metal haze came out i believe in the early to early mid 2000s forum yeah. era Dutch um, flowers. by these guys dutch flowers and they wrote amazing ad copy for the time their descriptions of how they how they describe their seeds they were offering was certainly an early case of using advertisement and language to sell seeds because yeah. they got people drooling over the shit right yep um and I believe our buddy Bodie, doesn't he have a metal haze F3 or something like that yeah, that he put and, out um, recently? Yeah, he put out one and, and the Rev had his cut of metal haze. Me and him did some stuff with it. Um, 
it's a Positronics Haze 19 skunk one, according to Jojo. And he's the one who supposedly made it for Richard Calrissian, who sold it as Dutch flowers. That's that. Yeah. So, um, you know, I'll, the, uh, um, but it, it, you know, at the time it was like metal hay. I mean, they would always claim that it would sell out within a day or two of being released. Yeah. And, and a lot of their stuff did. And a lot of stuff, their stuff. Off they the they were really good at the forums of getting people to be hyped up and yeah. at their computer and ready to buy when it dropped. Yeah. Uh, they were early adopters of that kind of technique. I grew a bunch of metal haze and metal haze F2s from seed lines and I grew uh, revs cut. And Rev's Cut to me was the supreme version of any of that stuff. Any of that stuff. It was so much better than any of the... A lot of the stuff that I saw from the, uh, the seed lines was mostly jungly flower that was not anything viable for today's market. It wasn't even that great of smoke. But his, his Metal Haze Cut, um, the Rev's, was more, I would say, Skunk One dominant um, in, its, in its flower time and its structure, but still with a hazy twist to it and a lot of terpeneline. And I should say before I forget, somebody mentioned that um, the Dutch flowers used to claim that it was named metal haze because of metal halides. Yeah. And that's actually true. Um, they went on and on and on about how growing their haze under metal halides brought out the equatorial uh, aspects was, of the sativa because of the, the type of blue. Right? Um, and if you grew correct. it under HPS, it wasn't going to do the same thing. Yeah, um, it's bullshit. It's bullshit. And, well, Everything you're saying is bullshit. I'm, I'm just saying that's what they said. Yes, that's their copyright. That, that, that's that. literally what they said. They said but, that it... But the original description of Positronics Haze 19 Skunk 1 was that it had a metallic coppery smell. Yes. And but that was of it. Of course, Dutch yeah. Flowers never, ever admitted their sourcing for it. No, no, of course not. No, they, that's, that, that's like this stuff all existed as a metallic haze from Positronics, but everybody kind of forgot that that whole copywriting from that and just moved on. Um, no Mercy Supply, I remember them. I, I, so, I don't uh, think they sold much to, to the US though. But yeah, people were, somebody, I don't know, hopefully the person that asked me was joining, C, someone said, is the C5 male still alive? Uh, and that's a, uh, there's a thing called C5, but that's a, actually a Northern Lights 5 by C ma uh, female. Yes. And that cutting is actually in, in Holland and it floats around America now. The C-Mail, uh, now Shanti says he has it. And there's great debate amongst our crew if he still does or not. He says he has Afghan tea too. He says he has it. Um, yeah, the funny part about the, the Afghan tea part is what he says is he lost the skunk part of the super skunk. Yeah. So the that, male. Yeah. But I do think because I've seen Shanti do this before with the um, the G13 Widow, that yeah. he may be leaving out um, a part of the genetics and saying, yes, we have Afghan tea, but it's probably an Afghan tea hybrid like Ash yeah. or one of those. So he says that he still has the the C-mail. Yeah. We know that for years he had it. Neville says he gave it to him. Uh, you know, uh, you know, Matt's buddy uh, posted a picture of it from the Swiss days in full flower. Mm -hmm. that we have uh, but there's great debate amongst the crew what he has and doesn't are you familiar with any of the kiwi seed stuff the mako haze and the, um no the, uh, i mean yeah. i've heard you i've heard you and crybaby and friends talk about it but that's i think not damp one that cream I've... i think damp cream might have bought out kiwi or or vice versa i can't it's been a while um, i will say that damp cream is my 11. is my favorite probably it's it's probably the coolest coffee shop when i was going it's ambiance, yeah, the way it was built. Uh, it would have, it had really nice weed, you know? Uh -huh. It had really good weed um, mm -hmm. often, you know? And so I like them. Yeah. You know, I mean, I haven't been there in, in a long time now, so who knows? But at yeah. least back then they were the bomb. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, people have their A5 and C5, do, people are talking about it. A5 and C5, which are both, uh, NL5 haze cuts. One uses the A dad, one uses the C dad. They're yeah. both alive in Europe and America. Um, yeah. They're super political. Uh, so it's very hard to breed with them. It's very hard to advertise that you have them. Um, yeah, yeah, that's get... been a big fucking issue. Like, I know people would like, you know, the NL5 crossed A5 and C5 or the Hawaiian lights crossed to it. It would be nice if we could do stuff with that, but. You know, politics are politics and people are bitches. 
And the, the thing about the Dutch is that with old cuts and stuff like that, it's all business. Yeah. So if they're not making money off it and you don't have permission on it, they don't really want to give you the right to do it. Yeah. And then you'll get a bunch of crap from them over it. Definitely. You know, uh, is kind of, is kind of the way it works, you know? Um, and, uh, yeah, so, you know, they, but that's, that's an issue, you know, like we don't know what Shanti still has. No, we don't. And, um, I, I did try to, to actually make a purchase, a big purchase from Shanti. Some, some people know about this in our crew where I, I was going to buy everything he had with Afghan tea just to see what, what popped out of it. But he wouldn't tell me what he was going to send me and just wanted me to send him, you know, thousand plus dollars on a, on a whim. And I kind of backed off from it. I kind of, I wish I would have, but like, you know, things are getting tight around COVID. And I was like, eh, eh, I, don't know. I have, I, I don't know when I'm going to do it. I have a, I have a probably like 700 seeds from Shanti that I need to pop at some point. I still um, have that big ass bag of Mr. Nice gear. Yeah. I mean, I have a, uh, I don't know. I, there's like probably 10 things that I have like 70 or 80 seeds of each. Yeah. Uh, you know, in the collection of stuff and, uh, do it to it. Do it yeah. To I mean, I had all, dude, I had all these plans and then in 2017 and 18 and not 19, but 20. So like there just kept being these crazy fires. Yeah. How dare you and, get burned down? You know, and we actually, uh, our, uh, my buddy, um, Papa and I, like we had a bunch of, we had, we had a bunch of stuff, uh, of Shanti's in the field. Um, yeah. and we had some of like my, like, uh, Mendo P by Maple, uh, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and it all burned. Yeah. You know, uh, he's got pictures of it, but we never, we never actually got to try it. Yeah. You know, so, uh, seed popping became like, you know, am I going to make it through the summer? Yeah. Uh, yeah, that result, last move I had like two moves ago, actually, not the last one. I popped a bunch of shit and then found out I had to move. They were selling my house. I'm like, that always happens. It always fucking happens. Yeah, it's rough. Traumatic it's event rough and it takes a long time to figure through. that, to figure that kind of stuff out. But I have some, I have some, I have four or five hazy things from Shanti. And then I have like four or five, six, you know, skunk Afghan NL type things from him just to see, Yeah, you know, um, I don't even know what that's in reference to. I'll just, I'll just, I'll just leave that one alone. Uh, sometimes I ignore the comments. Sometimes I look at them. But that one, I don't know. I don't know. Um, I don't know. But but that's a that's a, that word itself. You know, it really only has like one connotation in American use. Fleshy, flaccid member. I just flaccid in itself. I mean, when do you use it? You know. Yeah. Yeah. Makes me immediately think of Elon Musk for some reason. I don't know why. Yeah, I mean, you know, because he probably, you know, he's whatever. So, yeah. Um, but I, you know, I will say that, uh, yeah, Ortega, uh, there's a, and there's a bunch of mystery around that because Shanti, yeah. uh, maybe this is unfair, but Shanti is a little bit like uh, Cornbread Ricky in that uh, he talks in riddles a lot of times. And even yeah. when he explains stuff, that's this fair. Isn't, I think this isn't this isn't a diss to either one of them, by the way. No, like, I'm, but I'm just it. saying, like, <laughs> they write this these like three four paragraphs about something, and at the end, you're like, "What does this mean?" Yeah, crybaby you know? is also very very um, verbose and and uh, mystery writing. I'd say crybaby yeah. is good at that. Yeah, yeah, he's got he's got a good uh, mystery ad copy, at you know iambic pentameter. Yeah, I mean, there's, yeah, there you, you know, go. language, you know, language matters when you're trying to evoke, you know, yeah. something or whatever. And Raging so, voters. yeah, yeah. I mean, Shanti is, Shanti, yeah, cryptic. Shanti can be That's very clear. Sh sometimes Shanti in two or three sentences can answer something that you've been wondering about for 10 years and then not answer something else that's very simple in three or four paragraphs. So I, one thing I got to add, because I did say earlier that he was one of the anti-fem guys, despite all of that, in 2008, 2009, he went out of his way, to, despite hating feminized work, not wanting to do it himself, he was one of the first people to really, really educate me more about feminized work, how to properly do it and not just, you know, be throwing shit at a wall. He gave me a lot of recipes. He gave me a lot of advice during that time. And he's integral. It, it, he's, he's very integral into American feminized lines because of that. 
you know? So despite him having negative opinions on that, he was still kind enough to take the time to educate me and mentor me on femme stuff. So I thought that was really cool of him. I would definitely say that uh, in our crew of friends, I'm team Shanti. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I like him, you know, I think yeah. he's done a bunch, you know. You, you um, would tell him to kiss him on the mouth twice. I, you know, I don't know necessarily <laughs> about that. Uh, but, um, but he, but you know, he, he's been in it for a long time. Uh, he's another one of those guys that like, he kind of took the torch from Neville. Yeah. Um, you know, he's done a bunch of big work. Uh, he's been heavily involved in a lot of things and he's done something that's really hard, which yeah. is he's, he's, he's sold seeds for a living for a quarter century. Have you ever grown any of the, any of the mandala stuff? Ashberry? Um, there was some other stuff, a uh, uh, point, something to be on the brain, something. There are a few good ones that he had, Mandela Mike. Someone just asked about that. It was a similar era. Um, no. but totally, totally underrated. Totally underrated for, for the um, European seed scene. I think he's still around, too. He probably and is. I, and I honestly think, too, like, just so people know, it's not like I'm expecting if you run a bunch of, except for the Hayes stuff, you could find, I'm sure, some stuff in there. But oh, yeah. it's not like I'm expecting with some of other Shanti's lines that, like, you would find something that would just blow your head off completely and be as elite as some of the best stuff of today. Yeah. Um, but I do think that it tie like the genetics tie back to an era before all of the, the bottlenecking. Yeah. And so I think you could blend that, you know, I mean, like straight up, like imagine you took fucking something like cookie and threw it on, you know, any number of his things. Mango haze. Yeah. Or yeah. Nordle or whatever, you know, yeah. oh, and yeah. all of a sudden yeah. it's like, I just, it's just like so much different. Yeah. You know, it's not any of the same shit that yep. you're, you know, cause that's what happens these days is like, it's all the same 40 or 50 cuts blended together in different ways. Yeah. This is really what it boils down to. La Nina is a really nice strain. I like La Nina a bunch. I have a bunch of La Nina seeds. Uh, and our buddy, uh, uh, Yo Sammy. Yeah. Uh, talks about how they've crossed La Nina to various old Neville cuts and the results have been pretty phenomenal and they get sold in coffee shops and it's a, it's a good thing. Yeah. Um, La Nina is supposed to be a white widow by uh, Mullumbimby Madness. Um, so it's, it's like one of the few things that isn't, you know, uh, sativa direct from Sam. Yeah. I guess you'd say. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Uh, its, or right. its origins are mysterious, but both but, Neville and Shanti say that it came from, you know, this region of Australia. A lot of my friends out in Australia that have been growing for a super long time outdoors there that are really familiar with uh, the, the genetics that floated around there always go back to Indians and Thais. They think everything is, is Indians and Thais, basically the bushweed that they have out there or some combination of Indian and Thai. Whereas like with our American stuff, we have a lot of Colombian and Mexicans out there. That was where they were sourcing. That was what it was close to. That was their yeah. import. That yeah. was what they were getting free seed, you know? Um, yeah. And somebody is, uh, somebody and maybe Mean Gene or somebody mentioned the mango. Uh, the mango haze from Shanti is still a line that people find consistently good things in it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's one of my favorites. Of um, you know, um, and so it's, it's one of those things that even today, um, I have, uh, I found two mango haze phenos that I loved a bunch and kept for a long time. Yeah. Um, I lost them in a robbery, sadly, but I, it's good. I prefer someone, mango haze to super silver. Someone just asked about Wally. I actually talked to Wally um, about a month ago. We're old friends, uh, old friends. He's grown some of my stuff out in Australia and out back in 2007, I think. Mm -hmm. um, but I was talking about coming on the show and he said he would, but I think he just recently did a different show. So we'll see what's going on. I don't want to, you know, overwhelm the dude. So we'll see what's going on. And somebody asked about Yosami. Um, Yosami would be a phenomenal person to have on the show. For sure. Uh, yeah. He's got a wealth of knowledge. He started growing for Neville's crew in about 94, 95. Um, so he has a lot of firsthand experience with a lot of famous cuts. Yeah. Um, but he's a pretty private person. Yeah. Uh, and so I don't, you know, I don't know. Um, you know, he's been, I asked him before. Um, and, you know, it doesn't mean it couldn't happen, but it hasn't. Not yet. We haven't no, had a happen yet. It'd be cool though. No. I think he was great. he was very active on the on Mr. He nice was on the forums. forums when I was. Yeah. Yeah. He yeah. was extremely yeah. active back then, um, and he posts on IG a bit and stuff. But 
as far as like showing his face and talking and going through all that mess. Um, yeah. You know, and I, I totally respect people for having issues with that. Yeah, let's have Hempy on. <laughs> I, you know, I mean, I Hempy, would sooner smash my nuts in a drawer than bring on Hempy. I'm sorry. You know, in all honesty, for, <laughs> for all the people watching, the couple hundred or something that's here, um, Hempy would be a great ad. I mean, he might not, drive us nuts, but as far as entertainment, you know, uh, he would probably be like watching a train wreck. Yeah, it, I mean, at least if he talked, he wouldn't be typing and spelling. Cause that, yes. He would, yes. Yeah, he, I thought I was, I was a raging idiot even back then, but Hempy always had me beat. He was the guy to be like, bro, can you calm down a little bit? People are gonna hate you if you say that. And me saying that's someone. I mean, I, yes, he's crybaby, <laughs> I agree. I don't know what, I don't know where it would go, but the entertainment yes. value of having Hempy on. Tom Hill, you know, we, uh, we Tom Hill communicates I'm still with working our- on it. Tom Hill, it, it communicates with our crew. He would also be a great ad. Um, a lot of the old timers <laughs> are, are are very very they're they're characters you know yeah uh, they're characters i mean um, these people uh, people don't know we actually have an interview already recorded with um what's his name i mean do we really want to say his name i mean that's okay kinda... well i won't say his name but it was a person who who was one of the original owners of one of the earliest hydro shops in the pacific northwest and it was highly and... recommended by greg greg because he knows cause... a ton he was integral to the Nord Lights crew and all that stuff. But we haven't released it because some of these dudes, like, they didn't really want to talk weed more than they wanted to talk about fucking hookers. So I'll, I'll say this, I, which is <laughs> crazy. The guy talked at such a rate that I think I got two sentences in in an hour and a half. He made not so quiet, if you can believe that. I couldn't talk. And Matt and I were texting each other. And I would, we did get... I think one or two very interesting tidbits. Like half a second of what? But it was literally like, it's no exaggeration. It was probably 30 seconds of weed talk and an hour and a half of the craziest hookers and and Whoa. and, and yeah. stories from then and cops, Trump, <laughs> Trump and conspiracy theories. And it was, it, I, I mean, it was. We may release it one day just because he was very excited for us to release it. So why, you know. He was. I don't he was know. Very you guys excited to release it. We it? chose to sort of protect him um, yeah. by not releasing it because you know, and it was it was just the thing where it was like we were sort of interested in weed history, and he was sort of interested in telling us all the wild tales of his youth. Yeah, oh, I think which, he. I think he had a different uh, opinion. Like he thought maybe we were interviewing about his life as opposed to weed and the the his relation to weed. I mean, but it was also kind of like, even when you would try to steer him in the direction of talking more about weed, he would just mention it as a side and then get right yeah. back to something super kooky. Yeah. I mean, the dude was hella cool. He was fucking hilarious. So maybe we will, you know, like, I, I mean, I think now that we're past the Trump era and a lot of that, everybody's mad stuff, I think maybe we could release it now and it wouldn't be as, or maybe it would be a worse time to do it. I don't know. I mean, I don't know, dude. It just, it, it, it goes to show. Maybe we will have a poll. You can be very important in music or weed or art or this or that or whatever it might be. And outside of that, you can be a human with a wide variety of views, yes. you know? Uh, and a lot of us have some illnesses, you know, one kind or another, like there's something, there's something odd about weed people, you know? Um, yeah. And, uh, but I mean, it was like, it's, it, there's parts of it that are pretty risque, too. Yeah, like you know? I say some fucked up shit, and I say some off the wall homoerotic things even. And this some of this shit, I was like, God, I don't know if we can put that out there. Yeah, it was yeah. it was definitely R rated at yeah. certain aspects of it, you know, um, <laughs> which is fine, you know. But that's that's the thing is like, you know, there's an aspect where some of these old timers that are that were super involved can be tough interviews because they're they were kooky people when they were young. Yeah. And now they're old kooky people. Yeah. You yes. know? And I don't want them to get canceled over it or anything fucking crazy. Because that can happen, you know, like, if people think that he said something too extreme. But I think it's fun. And, like, the dude was an important part of, of that Pacific Northwest history. There's no doubt about that. He was there. I mean, 
he he even was a part of Operation Green Merchant and, and got oh, he wrapped was, up in it. He was definitely involved in tons of shit. Getting him to talk about any specifics yeah. was tough. Yeah. You know, he just, he, I mean, he was basically like, we were the audience. Yeah, oh yeah. And it was his, yeah. we weren't really interviewing him. It was like, we were there for his, his monologue. I did get a few, like, of my, my really weird, uh, where I try to keep a straight face and say something totally off the wall. I got like two of those in. I got two of those Somebody's, in the whole time. But yeah, I somebody said one. Eddie Lepp was a wild interview. Eddie Lepp, oh, I, I mean, I've talked about it before. He was a pretty, he was a decent friend of mine. Um, you know, he was a, he had huge balls and he was also a massive egomaniac. Yeah. You know, people are complicated. You know, we have, we have pluses and minuses. Um, you know, uh, Neville was complicated. Yeah. You know, Neville was a, you know, I mean, you know, Neville had addictions and Neville had issues and, you know, and all that type of stuff. But he also had huge balls. You'd be hard pressed to find, like, to get a crowd of a bunch of seed makers together and find more than 10 people that aren't ex-junkies. Like, we were all fucked up, most of us. I'm yeah. one of the 10. Yeah, I know. You're one of the very few. One of the you very know? few. But that was, uh, you can you can thank uh, Dead Tour for that. Yeah, yeah because I got, I got to see what even like successful junkies looked like. Yeah. And I was true. all, whoa. Yeah. That's intense. Being a you functional know? junkie is a real thing. Believe it I mean, I, in the sense, I, what I mean by functional is like the dude that I was traveling with, he just made so much money. Yeah. That he never had to do any of the, sh like the shit that people, like he, he made plenty of money. Yeah. He could easily afford his habit. So you just got to see it from the perspective of like, what does it do to you? Yeah. He didn't really have to hustle or lie or cheat or this or that or anything like that. That wasn't his thing. Yeah. You know, but when he ran yeah. out. Whoo, that shit hurts. That shit boy, hurts. You know, it's painful, painful feeling. Boy, that's a, that's unbelievable. <laughs> and, and the amount and the crazy part about it is, is that to go from like flopping like a fish and sweating and vomiting and pooping and, you know, fever and all this different stuff. And then <clears throat> somebody shows up and takes care of him. And he's like, let's get some tacos. Yeah, five minutes later. He, oh, he pops yeah. out. He's like, I'm going to wash my face. Let's go get some food. Yeah. And he just spent two hours in the hotel, like, in, in you know, unbelievable misery. Yeah, I can so, relate. That shit sucks, and it's for real. Yeah, but I mean, it's, that's, it's also true that a lot of that addiction and stuff was super common up in M Mendo and Humboldt and all that because it's dark and rainy in the winter. Yeah. And especially back in the day, people got lonely. You know, yeah. and they had a lot of money because, the, you know, weed sold for a lot back then. So there was a lot of people that ended, would, started out as back to the landers and ended up, you know, addicted to opiates or cocaine or this or that or whatever else because they were bored in winter. Yeah, I mean, even when I was I started my career as a, a fuck up, like everybody during that time wasn't just selling weed, at least out of our group. Nobody was just selling weed. Like, cause it was the, you were going to get the same charges. Didn't really fucking matter. If you were selling weed, you might as well be selling everything because other stuff made more money than weed. So yeah. it was, it was just, it was around. It was common during that time. But, but I mean, it, what's, we, in, what's different. interesting about that is not, not to diss Neville on it or anything like that. But what's weird is that Neville being a hardcore junkie is yeah. actually what brought him to Amsterdam. And because they had the seed And he was part Dutch yeah. and they had part of, you know, they had very liberal policies over there and they got extremely clean dope from yeah. a from Asia uh, traditionally. And so he went there to be a junkie. Yep. And then kind of fell into the seed game, you know, while there. So it's it's kind of like without without heroin, uh, a lot of the things that we talk about don't exist. Yeah, I think it was Clyde, Clyde that told me that Neville got um, he, he was the Dutch government had a program for people to get off heroin. They would help them with a trade. And Neville was breeding exotic bird seed, and they yeah, gave him was, money to start seed bank true. that way. Yeah. He was that is a true he, story. Yeah. he got grants uh, to get off dope and uh, claimed that he was breeding more nutritious, uh, you know, omega three, whatever the fuck, you know, protein so rich. Punk rock. You know, so yeah. Punk rock. And, and he and he took that money and he used <laughs> it to start the seed bank, uh, which yeah. is super punk rock, you know. Let, um, yeah, let the government pay for your fucking 
don't happen to be gone. And but a lot of the a lot of the pictures in those old seed catalogs and stuff like that are from his. He mentioned it. His photographer Clyde, who's still, I believe, still alive. Yeah, and, yeah, I talked uh, to him not so long ago. Yeah, and Clyde, and and you know he, you know he went with uh, Neville to, on Neville's Amsterdam trip. Yeah. You no, know, and, no, the Afghanistan trip. Yeah, the I'm sorry, yeah. the Afghanistan trip. And so a lot of the pictures, like in Neville's first catalog of him holding hash and him hanging out and smoking with, uh, with you know, the Afghans and stuff, that was all his, uh, his photographer, Clyde. And we, he's talked about doing an interview with us, but he also has some kind of movie deal thing with that specific story of the Afghanistan trip. So he can't legally tell it for some reason, like on I mean, a podcast. It's interesting in the sense that, um, you know, uh, maybe I should tell this because it's kind of funny, um, but Sam Skunkman and Neville both went to Afghanistan at different times mm -hmm. and they both have some pretty crazy stories about it. And Sam has this funny story about trying to get seeds from some of these Muhajideen yeah. and some of these fighters and stuff. And there's this warlord that looked at him and basically told him that uh, flour is for slaves and women. <laughs> <laughs> and it. real men smoked hash. And so was he a slave or a woman? <laughs> and Sam got and Sam got out of it by telling him he had no interest in the flower, that he agreed it was for slaves and women, but he wanted the seeds to be able to grow to make his own hashish in America. Ah, oh, brilliant. And so the, the Afghan warlord decided that was fair. Yeah. And then made him smoke a bunch of hash with him to prove that he wasn't a bitch, essentially. Yeah. You know? Um, and uh, yeah. And so, and then, you know, Neville, Neville has a story and, and Clyde has backed it up of going over there and having to negotiate with literal Mujahideen warlords. And, you know, they had a bunch of American money and were they going to get killed? Are they going to get robbed? And it sound the, the story coming from, from Clyde and Neville, that is one of the best stories ever, especially the one that wasn't published. There's yeah. one that's out there that he's that is part of the movie script that people have seen, but he told me the stuff that wasn't in that, and it sounds like a fucking nightmare. Like he was it, overdosed, dying yes. inside of this little tiny hut, and he had people trying to get. They were trying to get in to kill them. Like they wanted to kill them because they thought they were Americans with money, so they wanted to fucking kill them. So well, this, is a fun, this is a funny story about that, yeah. right? Is that in a weird way, uh, when we just talked about how without heroin, Neville never would have been to Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. When Neville went over there to get seeds, uh, the Afghanistan people were very worried about CIA and, D and, and these kind of groups and stuff. And so they wanted to make sure that he wasn't a European spy. Yeah. Right. And so in order to prove that, him and Clyde had to shoot heroin because they <laughs> because they were like, if you're not, if, you know, you're going to if you want these seeds, if you want this work, if you don't want us to kill you, <clears throat> you have to prove that you're not. And I know that an agent would never. Yeah. Yeah. That is so they both happened. they both had to shoot heroin in order in order. And, then, you know, they were both they both partied or whatever on that stuff. Yeah. But Clyde OD'd. Yeah. Clyde decided to die, you know, and so then he OD'd <laughs> in a fucking hut in some you know ancient village or whatever and had yeah. to you know and it was a, it was it wasn't like there was some like modern hospital nearby so he od'd on afghanistan uh, on afghan heroin neville yeah. didn't and they were like okay well these guys shoot up they yeah. made him shoot up in front of them and actually yep. use needles and the whole bit you know yep. uh and that's how he got the seeds yeah and then they tried to kill them <laughs> yeah, and then, the they, and, then they, the and then they tried to kill them. I would have died. I mean, I, you know, I yeah. couldn't have done it. You know, I didn't have any. Uh, I would have OD'd for sure. Yeah. Because yeah, uh, I, I have I zero, zero tolerance, you know. But I probably would have just been right there with Neville. <laughs> but Sam's story, I mean, <laughs> Sam didn't have to do drugs. But Sam basically, like, you know, the way he tells the story or whatever, it's like, yeah. you know, uh, an Afghan warlord was considering turning him into his bitch. Yeah, that's got to suck. You know, like yeah. maybe, you know, maybe. And so, yeah, so those, <clears throat> there's definitely some Indiana Jones aspects to those, like, uh, yeah, uh, going into war zones after seats. We need to have Bodhi come on and tell some of his Indian trips. Stories We've actually, the, in season one, we wanted to do, we wanted, we wanted to do a hippie hashish trail thing. 
Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Remember? And yeah, we wanted to yeah. put more time and effort into building it out because it's kind of a long story. Uh, and Bodhi agreed to do it, and it's just kind of gotten backburnered. Yeah. But it would yeah. probably be a great episode uh, because Bodhi has the experience of traveling, and Matt and I have a bunch, uh, and some friends have a bunch of documents and posters and different things from that era. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we could always get Joe Petrie if we wanted to get oh, the, yeah, King, of the King of Nepal. The we could get King the of King of Nepal. Nepal on. Holy shit, that would probably be as off the rails as Hempy or. He did a show with um with the uh, Blue Lies the other day. He did. Oh yes, yes. I Boy. Mean, likely duo. But there was there was you know a lot of the early Afghans and stuff like that because all the sativas that people have in, in America basically came with free seeds with the kilos. Yeah, yeah. But the hashish didn't come with free seeds. So Sam and Nev a bunch of these people had to travel the hippie hashish trail and go mm -hmm. find it and bring it back. Yeah. You know, um, Mel Frank says that the grower that he got the Afghani one seeds from in the Bay had done that. Yeah. You know, um, supposedly the Big Bud is from that. You yeah. know, uh, supposedly the Steve Murphy that started the NL1 or the NL lines is all from that. Yeah. Is all from different people going over to Amsterdam, going over to, you know, Afghanistan. It was, and a, it was a, a female that went and it was, and the, the, the Murphy Afghani is actually, they don't know if it was Afghanistan or Pakistan, yeah. but it, yeah, it was a, a girl that brought it back. Young lady. Oh my gosh. What do I think? Of, I, I don't know if I can answer that one. Um, you know, what do I think of the, what do I think of the, the burner and the Bodhi collab? Um, I'll just say this, uh, Bodhi's a good friend and he's done a bunch of very cool work. And there's a lot of people trying to figure out how to survive in this weird new world. Yeah. Um, and it's not easy. Yeah. Uh, and, um, cookies and burner and all those people aren't breeders and they are definitely looking to keep, they don't know where to go and they need help. Yeah. And they have to bring in outside help um, because they've had kind of their new new is sort of the same same that they've had forever now. And they don't know where to go with it. Um, and it's sort of irrelevant for Cookie to have new shit because it's like now they're a store and a clothing brand and they're just they're just established. Yeah. If all they had was that one cookie explosion in 09 to 12 that produced the OGKB and the animal and the this and the that and led to all this other shit. Um, you know, but Burner's a salesman. He's a rapper. You know, they're going to need to partner with real weed people. Yeah. You know, and Bodie's not a scumbag. No, he's a very nice guy. And I, 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 I'm stoked about it because I think it's, it's the way to influence the rest of the, the country, as it were, that, that listen to people like Cookies you can finally push them into like better weed and Bodhi knows good weed and he's a good person. With that said, if they fucking, if he gets fucked in this, I'll yeah. Anyway, I mean, look, yeah. what Matt is basically saying is that there's a chance to stand, stand outside and throw Molotov cocktails at every rich established group that's trying to take over weed. Like or I, you can try to work with them or work within their structure and move them in a different direction. Yeah. And there's arguments to be made on both sides. Uh, not every group is monolithic, but whether we like it or not, uh, you know, uh, rich, rich investor kids are taking over weed in California. Yeah. You know, and if you if you're not willing to work with rich investors, you don't have a chance. You don't have a chance in hell. You're going you to end up, stay, you know, on Friday nights home. telling fucking stupid history stories is what's going to happen. Well, I mean, you know, this is, this, <laughs> this, this is fine because this is actually a hobby for me and I enjoy bullshitting and yeah, I don't yeah. care if I make money. <clears throat> but, you know, I'll say this too. You know, we talked about it before. When I was doing the Superdog Project 20 years ago, there was no market for American seed sales. Yeah, There was almost no way to get a hold of people to sell seeds to them if you, they were interested in your seeds. Yeah, it was just too risky. Instagram in the last 10 years has created an environment where all these motherfuckers can start breeding and selling direct to the public. And or, there was this, buying seeds and selling those seeds. And there was, there's been an explosion of breeding, right? Yeah. And all that breeding was based on a bunch of small and medium sized farmers and thousands of indoors and thousands of small outdoors growing weed 
and pushing it through the traditional and the dispensary market. Yeah. Well, that's all been cut off now and it's gonna, it's all a bunch of corporations pushing weed through the dispensary market. The traditional market is trashed and there's not very much money in it. And so in order to sell a bunch of beans and have pheno hunting and do a bunch of that stuff, growers need to be making money. Yep. They need to be having disposable income to go to these things and buy a bunch of seed and look through it and have a bunch of it not work out and have one or two things they find they like. Yep. You know, and so the dynamics of seed making has changed dramatically. Yeah. Um, I'm actually, Matt and I chat about this. I'm actually more worried about diversity than I was before. You yeah. know, uh, legalization has been so far bad for diversity. Yeah. You know, um, and the way that they've set things up, you would think that you could really open it up, but you can't. Uh, they make it very narrow how to make money. Yeah. You know, and what to try and where to get it. And most people have to get stuff from nurseries. And so if the nursery doesn't want to make a commercial amount of clones of it, you can't even buy it. Yeah. They've made a lot of rules and a lot of regulations that, you know, it's not as easy. Like in the 215 era, motherfuckers could go to Emerald Cup or High Times or whatever and go see Matt and go see Bodie and go see Swamp Boys or go see whoever and buy packs of beans. And this is my next, this is my next 50. This is my next 25. Yeah. I'm growing these from seed outdoor next year. And, yeah, that's gone. And they, and all they needed to do to do that was money in their pocket and the desire. Yeah. You know? And now, now what do you do with all that? You yeah, know, that shit's gone. Be, now, now shit's gone. And so it's, it's hard, you know, um, and, uh, and on all that. And so a lot of that diversity is gone. You could look at the 215 era when we first got on IG really and how many hundreds and hundreds of small medical gardens would you see people posting shit that were growing 25 or 50 or 99 plants? Yeah. Tons. 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 Different, you know? man. And now yeah. it's not the case. And so, you know. So none of you get to talk shit about Bodhi or I'll fucking deal with all you guys. But, That's you know, seed say. makers like Matt or like Bodhi or like see any, any of them, everyone's got to figure out what they're going to do to survive because the market has changed and the buyers have changed and the pressures have changed. And how do you fit in? Yeah. I you hope know? he changes. I hope he changes things. And I hope, I hope that he's one of the, the avenues that opens a lot of, a lot of smokers minds to shit more than cookies and OG. Someone's got to do it. Someone has to break that mold. And I, I hope you know, it's and, him. And there's, there's an aspect to it where it's like, you know, the, 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 the bad part about it for anybody that's going to bitch oh, yeah. would be Bodhi decided to save his family by joining the Borg. Yeah. The good part of it would be Burner can promote the shit out of crappy weed. So what happens if Bodhi makes them improve their thing and he's promoting the crap out of much better weed? Yeah. And then people end up smoking much better weed. And then people and then, make money off much better weed. And then there's and, a connoisseur market that doesn't exist right right now currently. And the, you know? yeah, because you know it's like I so you know it, there's an aspect to it where it's like people can throw stones from outside, but it's not that easy of a thing. Where yeah. does a seed breeder go? You know, you yeah. can't even back in the day. How many how many gray area cups? You know, not gray area coffee shop, but how many cup? How many events would you go to a year? Yeah, yeah. You could be you could at be a seed a breeder and you could be at one or two events a month selling seeds to the public Easy. if you wanted. Yeah. Easy. Yeah, during some years you could. During some years, you know, and th and you would there would be a top dog booth and there would be a riot booth and there would be a CSI booth and there would be I remember the first year that Bodie was at Emerald Cup, right? Yeah. Like I didn't even get to talk to him till Sunday because I felt bad because there was literally like a eighty yard line. Yeah in Crazy front of his enough. booth friday and saturday all day long it yeah. was like a madhouse there was thousands of people with money in their pocket that were going to buy seeds from bodie and talk to him it was a beautiful time yeah now you can't do that because he's not licensed he's not registered yeah, it's not exactly. sold through whatever he doesn't have a dispensary license he doesn't have a he doesn't have all the fucking pieces of paper that allow you to just walk up and talk to him yeah yeah so that's hard so that you, the, the rules have cut off a lot of these independent types from even seeing you, you know, yep. and talking to you. I mean, you know, it, it would be funny, like when we would go to Emerald Cup and stuff, 
part of the reason why we started doing these candle candle illuminati parties is because none of the none of the friends got to talk to each other yeah yeah because they're all busy real. working their booth all day long because the customer wants to talk to them to make the yeah. purchase yeah and you and don't so want to be a rude fuck and so we started throwing these like nighttime events you know uh every night that the, every night that it happened at the emerald cup so that all the people after getting done working they could just go bullshit with their friends yeah, I wanted to see who the best kisser was, but he wanted to see his friends. I wanted to see my friends, yeah, you know? And so, so we, you know, we rented beautiful houses and we cooked out and, you know, we had bitter on the grill and we had a bunch of really good friends and tons of people would come, you yeah. know? Tons of, tons of breeders, tons of movers and shakers. And after they were done talking all day to customers, they wanted to hang out with people like them and shoot the shit. Yeah. Because before it's like, you're going to go up and you're going to try to talk to Bodie or CSI or something on, on Friday at three o'clock. <clears throat> and there's six people deep and 50 yards long waiting to talk. Yeah. Yeah. Those are stressful times too. Like yeah, and they're, you're, when and you're talking to a new person every five minutes, it's hard to remember shit. And a lot of those companies made bank off renting booths. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, a, a lot of people output thousands of dollars and hired friends to help them run the booth and move things and stuff. And so there's a cost to it. So you want to let people work. Yeah. You want to let people hand, you know, shake hands and shoot the shit and tell and talk about their strains and, you know, sell as much of their stuff to the public as they could. Yeah. You know, um, I mean, now this year, I think at Emerald Cup, they finally did this thing where there was like a little like legacy grower section. I heard, you know, where, you know, you could uh, you could go see people where they could have weed where it wasn't like it didn't have to be through a dispensary. Yeah. Through a distro. Because. Yeah. Essentially, the 215 era cups were like swap meets. Yeah, they were. Dude, pretty we wild. didn't know. We didn't know how good we had it with 215. Oh no! People could go and sell seed, and they could sell weed, and they could sell dabs, and they could sell this, and they could sell T-shirts, and they could just rent a booth, you know, have some basic licensing, and show up, and you know, meet people. Yeah, and uh, you know, and you know, it it um, you know, now it sucks. Yeah, someone, uh, someone mentioned that the other day. That someone talked about the party on a, a podcast the other day. One of the things that I'm, we, Matt and I made a big mistake on, and uh, COVID fucked us on the parties, but we're gonna we're gonna try to bring them back. Is that? Yeah. I wish we had given out like a hi, my name is. Yeah. Because a lot of these people, they don't know each other by sight. They know each other by their handle. Yeah, or we don't know each other by first name. By first either. names or something. Yeah. And so you're walking around and you're like, oh, that person was there? Yeah. Fuck. You know, because there's hundreds of people there. Not that you don't talk yeah. to your friends all night, but it's like there's people you miss. And maybe you'd walk by them and be like, holy shit, that's so-and-so. Yeah. You know? Next time, I'm going to have the dank dabber there. You watch. You watch. Oh, my God. You know? I love that guy. If you guys don't know, dank dabber's where it's at. He makes me smile. But it was cool. It was like essentially what we tried to do is like when can when cannabis got super legal, we tried to have like an old school harvest festival party where the tables were just covered in weed and jars of all different kinds and people could just roll joints and take bong hits and shoot the shit. And this is what I brought and this is what you have, you know? Mm -hmm. Um and so uh, you know, it it and eventually the last year or so we did it, I don't even think we went to the cup. No, no. We just waited for all the people we wanted to see to come and party and hang out. That first year I went, I went to the cup and I remember I got sick. I was like, there are too many fucking people here. I'm going to go back. And uh, yeah. But that was what was Never cool again. about a lot of those old events was it was organized chaos. Yeah. And now the more rules that they put into place with 64, it sort of cut off the customers from being able to go. I mean, especially like Emerald Cup in December. There would be so many people that would show up with money in their pocket from their outdoor. Yeah. Ready to yeah. buy seeds to Fino hunt for the next outdoor. Yeah. And that was that hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars were spent on just that. Oh yeah. Easy. Lots of money, you know, was, was, was spread out. And so and now what is, one year it was gone. That was yeah, just and done. Then, so yeah. now there's now the whole market, now not only the seed, the seed makers ability to get in front of people, right and to build their brand or whatever you know yeah or like the the seed makers ability to sell or even the people that would normally buy their seeds how little they're getting for weed right now 
yeah really puts a lot of pressure on seed makers yeah yeah it's a different time dude but, you know they have they're gonna have to adapt how they're doing things and you know we'll see who sticks and with that i think i gotta start getting ready to wind it down because we're all right near the well we've been in an hour. hour and 45 minutes yeah again i'll let matt do his pitches you okay know, uh, pitches he might have <laughs> So we have the Breeder Syndicate Patreon. You can find it by going to Google, type in Breeder Syndicate Patreon. If you go to Patreon and try to search it, it won't show up because it's a weed one and they don't allow that. So do Google Breeder Syndicate Patreon and you'll find us. And you can come hang out with us. We have a Discord. We all hang out, watch fights. We do all kinds of stupid shit in there. And um, go check out Speakeasy Seed Bank. They help produce the show. And uh, riotseedco.com for all the NL stuff and, yeah. and Hawaii life stuff. Uh, you can always DM me side. on IG. There you, you know. go. You can ask me questions through there. Or you can join the Discord and you can hang out over there. Uh, and everybody, again, we always appreciate your Friday night. Sorry about missing last week. Uh, we'll be back next week. Yep. All right. Thanks, everyone. Peace, everyone. Peace. Want more Breeder Syndicate? Be sure to check out our Patreon by going to Google and searching Breeder Syndicate Patreon. We have a secret Discord where we are available at most times and interact daily. There are a lot of perks to be had there, so check it out. Need seeds? Check out RiotSeeds.com where you can get our seeds and our reversal spray for making your own feminized seeds.